Welcome to this presentation on golf from 1870 to early 1900s in the United Kingdom. During this period, new golf course openings significantly increased, reflecting an increased interest or popularity in the game. The majority of these openings occurred in Scotland and England. Most of the classic courses that opened during this time were Lynx courses, like Troon shown here, that was laid out in 1878 with an official design in 1887 by Willie Fern. Muirfield, home to the Honorable Gentleman of Edinburgh, was laid out in 1891 by old Tom Morris. Royal Birkdale was originally laid out in 1889. An interesting note or mention in the club's minutes was on December 23, 1889, when the members of the club voted unanimously in favor of allowing ladies to use the links. Quote, unquote, on and not exceedingly three days each week, but not on Saturday or a bank holiday. In 1897, the club moved to the Brookdale Hills where an 18-hole course was constructed. The course was redesigned in the, in the middle 1930s by a company called Hawtrey and J.H. Taylor. Hawtrey was a prominent golf course architect of the time and the other player who had dominated the Open Championship, J.H. Taylor, during a 20-year period immediately prior to World War I. Autry and Taylor's philosophy was to lay out holes in the valleys between the sand hills rather than over them. This enabled Brookdale to gain the reputation of being one of the fairest of the championship courses. And you can see that here in this picture. Royal Litham and St. Anne's was laid out by greenskeeper George Lowe in 1897. This course, along with the ones previously mentioned, are just some of the courses that are still part of the current course rotation for holding the open. When you look at growth of golf during this time, you can see that the number of golf courses in 1857 in Scotland was only 17 courses. It gives you an idea that for hundreds of years, golf was not played by many people, nor were there many golf courses. Yet in a short period of time, that number increased rapidly. In around 1900, there were 2,000 golf courses. Golf courses were designed or laid out by members of the club, golf professionals, or greenskeepers. Normally, the course was laid out in a day or two. The process was basically placing stakes where the tees and holes were to be located. Most of these courses were extremely rudimentary. Some of the first architects were golf professionals and or greenskeepers, included Alan Robertson, who widened the fairways at St. Andrews for the purpose of alleviating congestion. He also redesigned the 17th green, which is shown here. The 17th at St. Andrews is a famous hole known as the Road Hole. He also helped lay out other courses too, which included Carnoustie. Old Tom Morris helped design Carnoustie with Alan Robertson, but also designed Prestwick, which is shown here, and Muirfield, where he was the first to develop the Loop Nines, where the 9th and 18th hole ended up back at the clubhouse. Link's courses at the time were routed out from the clubhouse, and once you reached number 9, you would turn and come back toward the clubhouse for your last 9 holes. In addition, Old Tom Morris designed La Hinch in Ireland, which is shown here. He also did Royal North Devon, known originally as Westward Ho, and several other notable courses. Other golf professionals or greenskeepers who designed golf courses included the Duns and David Strath at North Berwick. The courses that succeeded during this time, or are still around, are mainly links type courses. During this time, a number of golf courses that were built inland from the sea and river estuaries failed, usually within a year. The courses were poorly designed, crude in nature, and geometric in shape. For example, greens, tees, and bunkers would often appear as circles, rectangles, or squares. 
Once golf courses were built or laid out inland, environmental conditions changed drastically. Where the Lynx courses had soils that were deep sand profiles and alluvial deposits on top, the soils inland were heavier with greater proportions of silt and clay. The golf courses became mushy in the winter and dry in the summer. During the spring, when wet, lush growth occurred, often resulting in thick, green grass, golfers were unable to hit a ball, and for the most part, their clubs and balls quickly deteriorated. I put this map in just to show the changes in soil types that occur through Scotland. The types of grasses changed to once you moved inland. For example, the natural fine fescue types found on lynx courses were not found inland. More pasture types of grasses were used. Just a small case study. The Golf Club of Dublin in Dublin, Ohio was built as a lynx style course. Except for the greens and tees, the grasses used were similar to those you might find at St. Andrews. At St. Andrews there are various types of grasses on the course and as many as six different species on the greens, but why digress? Here in this picture you can see the tall grass around the bunkers like you would find on the lynx course, fine fescue. On fairways, fine fescue has good drought tolerance, as long as it's being grown on sandy soils. It does not perform well on clay soils that can get compacted or under wear stress that would be found with golf carts. And under dry conditions, which is how lynx courses should play, fine fescue does not do well on clay soils. In this case, the course had fine fescue as part of the seed mixture, but the predominant species was Kentucky bluegrass, which does much better under these conditions. Climate conditions play an important part in the survival of golf courses. Just moving inland in England or Scotland, the temperatures become more extreme. Not necessarily like when you are comparing conditions in Dublin, Ireland in July with those, for example, Charlotte, North Carolina. But the failure of many inland courses drove many to believe that golf should only be played on lynx land. Inland courses in general face some interesting challenges besides climate, the type of grasses, and soil conditions. This is a photograph of Penrith Golf Club in northern England. Penrith Golf Club was founded in 1890, and this picture is dated around 1910. The course was leased from a race course on which golfers had priority, but few were prepared to stand firm in face of a cavalry charge. The members bought a lawnmower for the greens, a hole cutter, and a spade. They engaged a professional to plan the course, which took him two weeks to lay out, and for his work the club paid them four pounds, or a little over six dollars. Although this is a recent picture, for a few years in the early 1900s, the course was also used by a local soccer club. The first fairway went through the soccer field and it was agreed among those involved that the golfers had the right of way. The matches stopped until the golfers had passed through. The landowners also leased the land to farmers for grazing and also allowing trainers to exercise their horses. The golf club objected, but it was agreed that the horses could be exercised before 10 a.m. and that all hoof marks had to be repaired the same day. In 1909 a greenkeeper was appointed for one pound or about a dollar fifty a week. A horse-drawn mower was purchased but a horse had to be leased. Twelve months later a horse was donated by Glass and Brewery. In 1910 Proper bunkering was introduced to replace the current hazards that were removable hurdles covered with netting. During World War I, a large part of the course was plowed up and the farmer was allowed to graze his stock free of charge. In 1919, Dr. Alistair McKenzie was engaged to redesign the course. The work was completed by the end of 1922 at a total cost of approximately 1,500 pounds. A new clubhouse was built at a cost of 300 pounds. One request by the women was that the ladies' toilet be improved. The male chauvinists of the club suggested that a small door be constructed so that the women's toilet pail could be extracted from the back or side of the building so that the pail not be carried through the locker room. 
During World War II at Penrith, local rules were introduced. Some of those rules seem extremely strange, but was a reflection of the times. For example, if players were bombed or strafed, they could seek shelter without penalty, and shell or bomb splinters could be lifted without penalty. A ball lost or destroyed by enemy action could be replaced, again without penalty, and a player whose stroke was affected by an explosion or machine gun fire could play another ball without penalty. These anecdotal comments about Penrith Golf Club were provided to me by Martin Jones. Another inland course is Lindrick Golf Club, founded in 1891, was typical of a course where golfers often became frustrated. During these early days, the course constantly changed, hence a suggestion by a member, that a notice board be placed at the entrance to the club room to notify the changes of greens and teen grounds. Additional criticisms included that the ground committee endeavored to improve the lies on the course and, quote, the so-called bunkers be leveled down and proper bunkers be built, and a final desperate suggestion that 5,000 cattle be employed a day and night to eat up all the herbage. You will be happy to know that when I checked Lindrick's website recently, that Lee Westwood, who is a professional golfer and is also a member of the club, is quoted as saying, Lindrick is always in great condition with fairways like carpets and greens that run true. On these early courses, especially the Lynx courses, how the grass was maintained and how bunkers came about is always a point of discussion. Sheep are often cited as being an integral factor in course maintenance. This is a picture from Penrith Golf Club. Even up to 1963, sheep had been allowed to graze the course in winter. If you are using sheep to graze your course, and there are still courses in England and Australia that do, you want to generally keep them off the greens. Also, the cost of playing these courses is generally low. At Penrith, subscriptions or memberships during this time was only 8 guineas a year, or about $13. In some articles, writers have often stated that sheep were responsible for creating bunkers, scraping out the hollows to seek shelter. I'm going to take a rather tongue-in-cheek approach to this discussion and start off by saying, do these look as if they would have the sense to shelter? I suppose the sheep built the steps as well. Sheep are not renowned for their intelligence or their ability to dig. On lynx land, the rabbits were responsible for much of the erosion that formed bunkers and certainly were responsible for grazing the close crop turf. On lynx golf courses where golf shots ended up and then the turf was removed from repeated shots, in combination with the wind, the loss of vegetation in these areas resulted in small sand depressions that became larger as the wind blew. By the end of the 1900s, Golf is in the grips of its first boom. Most of the courses that are successful are Lynx courses, with many inland courses having failed. The golf boom, for the most part, is in the United Kingdom. However, this is the Victorian age, when England rules the world, and the old saying, the sun never sets on the English Empire. In those far-off places where England rules, golf follows. This concludes this presentation.